All right, welcome in. We are live. Uh, Tennessee is putting the finishing touches on a win over the Creighton Blue Jays. Uh, about 20 seconds left in that one. Um, a game that I, I was very excited about because of the cool-ass white boys, Baylor Shireman versus Dalton Connect. I think I said last night that I expected this to be a game decided by a non-cold-ass white boy, that uh, one of the role guys was going to have to step up, and, and I thought that Shireman and Connect would, would sort of play each other even. That kind of happened, but in the end, this was a game of, of just Baylor Shireman versus Dalton Connect. Um, fun game. Tennessee had that 18-0 run. Uh, I, I feel terrible for Creighton, but also this is how the NCAA tournament works. I really like this Creighton team. I felt like uh, you know, the, the, when the, when the bracket came out and you kind of start realizing that only one of these teams is going to be able to make the elite eight when I felt like all season, they both, uh, could be final four bound. Um, you know, you, you feel for the loser, but that's how it goes in the NCAA tournament is one team moves on the other one doesn't. And Tennessee gets a date with the Purdue Boilermakers. Now a team that they've already played this year, uh, a team that they played, Five years ago um, in the Sweet 16, and uh, Tennessee and, and Purdue had a great game in that one, and Purdue beat Tennessee, and then Purdue went on to lose to Virginia in the, in the Elite Eight. Uh, these are two programs that have a little bit of history. There are two programs coached by guys who cannot get over the hump. I'm going to get out ahead of it right now and say whatever happens on Sunday, the losing coach is a fraud and should probably be on the hot seat because he'll never, ever, ever do it at the school that he's at. So um, I just want to put that out there right now. Matt Painter – and or Rick Barnes. Well, I guess it can't be and. Matt Painter or Rick Barnes. One of them will be a fraud, and we'll find out on Sunday. Uh, ever wish you could call a foul on your wireless carrier for their hidden fees, and it's time to switch to Visible. Switch to Visible, the wireless company with nothing to hide, and get one-line wireless with unlimited 5G data powered by Verizon, just $25 a month every month, taxes and fees included. No hidden fees, no gotchas. One-line wireless, just $25 a month, taxes and fees are included. Don't let hidden fees stop you from being a fan of wireless. Switch to Visible and save. Switch now at Visible.com. Rate with service on the Visible plan for additional terms and network management practices. See Visible.com. Uh, fun night tonight. Uh, some great games. Oh, Creighton uh, must have hit a three. It's a six-point game now. Do we have that on the TV? Can we get that on? We don't have the – we were watching the game in the other room, and then we just assumed. But that's how – I don't have a way to tell what channel is this is on. Mm. It's just been commercials the entire time. Or I'll try to – I'll try to uh, – Is it? No. No, that is the that is the Dallas Mavericks versus Sacramento Kings. Thank also God a good yeah, right. also a good game. It looks like uh the Mavs are up by three with with twenty seconds left. Um anyway, fun night of fun night of basketball tonight. Um I don't know where we want to start. I guess the big story, story wise, it wasn't the game of the night, but it was kind of the story of the night. Marquette uh turned into Arizona tonight against NC State. The the dream NC State run continues and uh we're now in a position where um you have Duke and you have NC State playing for a trip to the Elite Eight. You have an ACC that has three teams in the in the or playing for a trip to the to the Final Four. They're both in the Elite Eight. Uh, the ACC has three teams in the Elite Eight. Uh, but this NC State team, you know, Clemson is is kind of a surprise. I think Duke has always had the talent. Um, we'll talk about Duke and Houston, which is basically just Jamal Shedd's ankle, and uh, that is the game. I mean, it's it's hard to point to one thing and say that was the difference. Um, and if his ankle doesn't get rolled that that Houston definitely wins but I will I will do that uh so we have that to look forward to later in the show um but NC State is is when you're talking about the ACC and this unexpected run from the ACC uh it's basically just NC State is is on an absolute tear and uh it's it's challenging my belief I'm in a tough spot with this NC State run because I am a guy who traditionally does like Cinderella's to a point. And I think the sweet 16 is when the Cinderella's in an ideal world in my perfect world. And I'm not, I'm not speaking for everybody and everybody has their own preferences. But for me personally, I, I, I cheer for Cinderella's until the sweet 16 comes along. And then I want the best teams to advance to the final four. And I want, I want an absolute banger final four. I want, um, the, I want it to be representative of the four best teams in college basketball, uh, with the, with the highest stakes imaginable, and we get some awesome games, and the drama builds, and and that's that's the ideal situation to me. Um, so in the past, I've I've kind of been the guy who's who's shitting on the the Cinderella stories. I'm kind of the guy that's like, yeah, this was fun that they got here, but now I have to watch this shitty Final Four game that nobody wants to watch, and you all know you don't want to watch this, but we have to pretend like we want to watch it because the Cinderella's here, yada yada yada. 
I think I might be a hypocrite because I, I kind of have no problem with this NC State team. There's something about it. It's not just that they're Cinderella. It's that they are the funniest Cinderella ever. They are it, they, they are not just like a middle-of-the-pack power conference team that uh, showed some flashes throughout the year and also had some bad losses, and now you know they're just peaking at the right time, whatever. NC State was done. They were they were dead. They were done. They were done many many times on this run. Um, they they really have not been that good of a basketball team at any point in this season. They uh, they had they they beat Clemson. I mean, I'm just gonna go through. I'm gonna go through their schedule for everybody. Um, their their big win was Clemson in February. They beat they beat Clemson at Clemson by one in a very close game. Uh, this was in the middle of a streak where NC State closed the season losing seven of nine. I'm going to count that up again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They lost seven of nine to close the regular season, and then they have to now play five. As we all know, they had to win five games in the ACC tournament in five days to even make the NCAA tournament. Um, and in the first game against Louisville, they are tied with four minutes and 50 seconds left in the game. There's a little under five minutes left in the game against a horrendous Louisville team, and NC State was tied. Uh, they... <laughs> They go to overtime with Virginia because Virginia doesn't foul, and they hit a miracle three to keep the run going. They beat North Carolina, um, and you and you're at a point where you're you have no choice but to just tip your cap and respect how NC State is pulling this off because uh, unlike a lot of Cinderella runs, and unlike a lot of teams that get put in this position that NC State's in, where they're an 11 seed and uh, you know they they are are very surprisingly in the Elite Eight, um, they are knocking off good teams. Uh, Texas Tech was a was a good basketball team. Texas Tech, I don't think I, I ever really thought was was good enough to win a national championship, but they beat Texas Tech pretty easily in the first round. Um, Oakland, of course, was an upset, and and you know they they get taken overtime there. I don't I don't uh, I don't want to pretend like Oakland was an awesome team, but Oakland wasn't really that bad of a team at all. Um, but now they knock off Marquette, who was one of the better teams in the country this year. Uh, and you look back at their run through the ACC tournament. They they beat Duke, they beat Virginia, they beat North Carolina. They they beat the three best teams in the conference to even make the tournament in the first place. Now they're beating Marquette. So NC State has has won eight games in uh, not in eight days, but they won five and five and five days. They won eight games in a row now. Eight games that they have to win or else their season's over. And as as much as you want to poke holes in, in, in the run and, and how they got here, like I mean at this point you have no choice but to tip your cap and say, damn, this is this, something must be going on here. They must they, they must have a clover up their ass or something. Um but just like Clemson, i I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that Marquette couldn't hit shit. Marquette turned into Arizona. That was wild to watch. Uh I I I feel for Marquette. I I I don't I don't know. Like, cause it's it's one thing to lose in the NCAA tournament. It's another thing to lose in a way that does not resemble how you have played basketball at all throughout the season. And I guess that's the joy of this event is that um, Marquette comes out against NC State and can't hit anything, and they they dig a little bit of a hole. And NC State's got nothing to lose. They got all the juice. Uh, they they are very fired up that they're even in this spot. Um, and and they are the underdogs, so they're coming out playing a lot looser, and they're very familiar with this position that they've been put in. You know, they've they've already had to win seven of these games, so what's what's an eighth to them? Um, they're hitting shots early. They're playing defense early. Uh, Marquette can't hit anything, and I feel like Marquette just goes into panic mode way too soon in this game, and and they just start making uncharacteristic errors. They look. I think uh, was Ian Eagle on the call for that one. It's all running together. I can't remember, but uh, whoever was calling the game was like just kept pointing out uh, how out of sorts Marquette looked, and um, I think they I think they were well passed out of sorts. I think they were just like unrecognizable. It was unrecognizable Marquette basketball. Um, they're throwing balls into the crowd. They're just they're, the the dumbest turnovers. They're. Uh, uh, Iguodaro had a had a pick and roll. I forget who was handling the ball, but someone tried to make like a pocket pass to Iguodaro, and they hit him in the ankles. Um, and this is a team that that is well led by Tyler Kolick, and they they move the ball, and their offense is like usually a well oiled machine. And and yeah, sometimes they're not going to make shots, but uh, it just snowballed into a situation where they they just looked like they had no idea what the hell they were doing. And this is the first time they've ever played basketball together. Um, fascinating to watch to say the least because uh i i certainly i didn't watch every marquette game this year but i never saw marquette look that discombobulated uh as i did tonight so you're, you're you know the part of you that's like this is this was an unusual performance from marquette nc state got lucky but also 
if you get lucky eight times in a row, at some point you got to acknowledge that there might be something to this. Um, so this NC State, I, I am I am very pro NC State. I, I want NC State to keep winning. Uh, I I love this ride that the, that they're on. I love the idea that Kevin Keats uh, was four minutes and fifty seconds away from being fired. Uh, like not not just eventually, he was going to be fired that night. I think if I think if NC State lost to Louisville uh, in the first round of the ACC tournament, Kevin Keats would have been fired that night. And now he wins the ACC tournament, gets a two year extension. The Wolfpack are onto the Elite Eight, where they are playing a Duke team. Where what was it two weeks ago? They they played Duke on a neutral court in a tournament setting in a must win game, or else their season was over. And they beat them. So, um, you know, you can argue it's hard to do it twice in a row like that, or you can argue that that NC State has has already done this before, and uh, they're in a great position to do it again. But uh, yeah, tough tough night for Marquette. Uh, you, it, I I. I don't know. It, it it sucks. I I do feel for him again. I, that's how this tournament works. There's only going to be one champion. Everyone else is going to be very sad, uh, and and they're going to go home feeling like they they didn't quite accomplish what they set out to accomplish. But there's an extra sting to it when you're a team like Arizona, you're a team like Marquette, and you go home not just as a loser, but uh, as a loser who has to uh, just deal with the feeling that you didn't even kind of play your brand of basketball like you you're going to look back on this this will haunt marquette forever this will haunt arizona forever um and yeah i i just i when i watch that happen i'm just like man these these guys are gonna be what was marquette from the three-point line they ended up uh i think they hit four they hit like a late one it was uh marquette was yeah four for 31 jesus four for 31 from the three-point line uh I swear NC State had more buzzer beater threes at the shot clock buzzer. I swear NC State hit more hit just as many at least buzzer beater at the shot clock buzzer threes than Marquette hit threes of any kind in this game. Um Cam Jones was three for twelve. Joplin was 0 for seven doing a doing a Caleb Love RJ Davis impression. Uh they couldn't hit shit. And you know, that's it's brutal. Mar- Marquette is not a bad shooting team, um, but also the, it snowballed. And I think that that was the shocking part to me is, like, missing shots happens. That's the nature of a one-and-done tournament. That's the nature of uh, college basketball. These guys are very talented, but also uh, there is some variance with shooting um, at, at the college level that maybe doesn't exist at, at the NBA level, which it even exists at the NBA level, but it's, it's more pronounced at the college level. You can have a team that, that is a very, very good shooting team and, and they have a, they have a cold night. What was crazy to me was how the wheels fell off and how it just felt like Marquette was panicking for like 34 minutes of that game, 30 minutes of that game. It just felt like the panic set in very, very early. And it was reminiscent of last night uh with Arizona against Clemson so maybe there's something to those ACC teams I mean I I the the cynics and the critics will say that that they're lucky and that uh all these teams that they're playing are just bricking threes um I I do think in a vacuum that that luck could be the factor the determining factor but over enough instances at some point you have to shrug your shoulders and say maybe luck has nothing to do with it maybe there is something to uh what they're doing here DraftKings, uh, the thrill and excitement of March Mania is here in DraftKings Sportsbook. One of America's top-rated sportsbook apps is giving new customers a shot to turn 5 bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. North Carolina listeners, and I imagine there are a lot of you because uh, there are two teams from North Carolina still in this tournament. Two out of One quarter of the teams left in this tournament are from the state of North Carolina. Do not forget the DraftKings Sportsbook is now live in your state. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code TITUS. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets. Only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code TITUS. The crown is yours. Um, yeah, in, this NC State team is fun. Um, DJ Burns is is has become the face of, of the team, and uh, – you know, the, the DJs together are, are what make them go. And DJ Horn was the, the scorer tonight, had 19 and um, hit some clutch shots and uh, had had Marquette scrambling trying to stop him. But, uh, yeah, DJ Burns was like the face of the team. He's the one guy. I, I think he's like the singular guy that people, the casual fan, identifies as the face of this NC State run yes. is DJ Burns, right? Would you say that's fair, TJ? I think he's the face of the tournament from the casual fan's perspective. He's like the guy that – 
20 years from now, whatever, people remember this NC State team because of DJ Burns. Yeah, and it, what's crazy is that he had four points tonight. Right. Um, and he didn't have a bad game. He had seven assists. Uh, he only shot four times. Um, but that's what makes him dangerous. I think all these dudes are playing very, very loose. Uh, Casey Morsell hit how many fadeaways where he just drove to the bucket, stopped on a dime, turned around, hit a little fadeaway from like 10 feet out. Um, Horn's feeling it. Middle Brooks comes in. He's he's you know giving them good minutes. Uh, O'Connell is is he was three for ten tonight, but he's you, you need him to knock down threes. He was two for four from behind the arc, and that's if, as long as he's doing that, he's doing his job. Um, yeah, I think they're all playing loose. They're all playing confident, and uh, it's it's showing. And the more this goes on, and the more they're putting this underdog spot, I do think the psychology of it all is is coming to a head. And I think that that if NC State and Marquette play that game. In you know the middle of January, on a neutral floor, it's a very different result because Marquette's assholes don't get all tight early in the game when they start missing shots. But there was something to it, and uh, that's why we love the NCAA tournament. Um, what else? Uh, Purdue Gonzaga. This was I, I said last night. This was going to be the most interesting game of the night, and uh, it was for for a little while. Purdue obviously steps on the gas in the second half and pulls away. Um, I thought Gonzaga. Had a great game plan. Gonzaga uh, put Zach Eady in ball screens like crazy. I, I, I assume, I have to assume, I can only assume, this has to be the end of the Zach Eady National Defensive Player of the Year campaign. Uh, this is, this was, I mean, he was, Gonzaga was over and 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 over again going at him. Um, and they were doing it because they know what I know, what every coach in the country knows. He cannot move his feet. He cannot guard ball screens. Um but I will say, in Zach Eady's defense on the defensive side, and we'll talk about his impact on the offensive side in a second, um, Gonzaga pretty obviously all week was drilling like short rolls, and uh, their big dudes would, would – uh, the, the instances when Nimhard or, or whoever else would dump it off to him, um, they were told, like, don't go to the bucket and try to dunk on Eady or don't go try to finish through contact. Just pull up for a little five-foot floater. And uh, as the game was wearing on, Edie got to a point where he like wasn't even actually challenging those shots. He was just kind of good with chilling and, and letting them shoot those shots. And uh, Gonzaga was still not trying. Like I, I felt like Gonzaga had a few instances where they could have, on the rolls, they could have just tried to dunk on him or tried to finish through contact or whatever else. Um, so Edie's like, reputation as a, a behemoth shot blocker definitely intimidated them. And uh, I, I think that, was, that, that proved to be a difference. Uh, but but Gonzaga Gonzaga for the first half was 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 looking great. The both offenses were looking great. Uh, Purdue was hitting everything, and if, if that's the case, I mean, if Purdue shoots the ball, and they have they have throughout the year, they, they're one of the best three point shooting teams in the country. If Purdue can shoot the ball like they did tonight, uh, there is no stopping them. There's 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 really not. Um, and 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 that's. Yeah, I don't know how you're going to stop Purdue. If they're nine for twenty from three, uh, Braden Smith was the best player on the floor. Fifteen assists, fourteen points. Uh, I know Edie had twenty-seven and fourteen, and we have to tip our cap and say Zach Edie made it was a difference and yada yada yada. I, I I don't think he was. I think it was Braden Smith. I think Braden Smith was was by far the best player on the floor. And uh, I've been getting a lot of shit, TJ, because I finally have acknowledged publicly that like Zach Edie watching Edie ball, watching Edie post up and and. Uh, he had, I mean, he had three fouls in the first half, and they didn't call any of them. But whatever. Um, I, I don't, I don't like watching Zach Eady post up and and turn for a little baby hook. But I will say, the rest of the Purdue team is very, very fun. Braden Smith is very fun. When Braden Smith is hunting his shot and running the offense, it is very fun. When Fletcher Lawyer is making stink faces, it's very fun. When Lance Jones is hitting big shots, it is very fun. Uh, the rest of the Purdue team almost makes me hate Zach Eady. I don't hate Zach Eady. I, I, I just don't like watching. Uh, I mean, he. I, I just don't like watching him posting up. I, I don't. And and all the times that Purdue has been the most fun to watch is when everyone else is cooking. And that was that was the difference tonight. And as, and Eady ended up getting his. Um, but this game was won by all the other guys. This game was won by by Jones and Smith and he, uh, uh, and Lawyer. And Mason Gillis hit a couple threes. He, like, never misses. Mason Gillis, is, it says here he's two for three. That's a lie. They must have given a miss to him that someone else missed. Um, Ethan Morton with a big two two foul. Tri it says, by the way, Ethan Morton, holy shit. Ethan Morton just, like, revolutionized trillions. He played less than a minute, so he has zero minutes played, but he had two fouls. 
What? So he has he has a two. It's a zero 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 two zero. What a stat line. Yeah, I was watching. He comes in at the end of the first half, and he fouls twice because they had fouls to give. Um, and then and then that was it. That was all he played. But because it was less than a minute, it technically says zero minutes played. That's incredible. Uh, yeah, I, I felt like Gonzaga uh, had a great game plan, and, um, you know, they, they had some, some – op- there was a sequence in the second half, I think at this point Purdue had already pushed the lead to like 10, where I think Gonzaga missed three pretty good open looks – from three in a row, um, and that was pretty much it. I mean, like, if you're – you have to hit those shots if you have any hope of pulling off the upset, especially when Purdue is shooting as well as they are. Um, but, yeah, it was a fun game. The first half especially was was very fun. Uh, it felt like neither team could guard each other. Uh, Nimhard was pushing pace. Gonzaga had Purdue scouted really, really well and um, was was had Edie just running in circles, and, and they're dribbling and handing it off, and they're, they're coming off ball screens and handing it off for another ball screen, and – uh yeah, they, Gonzaga ultimately, you know, was didn't have the horses to to stick with Purdue, and I I think Purdue, other than UConn, Purdue probably looks as good as anyone else does left in this tournament. Um, but there's no shame in in what Gonzaga's season ended up being, and I felt like uh they fought to the end, and 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 what I was worried for on Gonzaga's behalf came to fruition. Now it's not that hard to figure out. Zach Eady is the number one foul drawler in college basketball, and Graham E.K. struggles with foul trouble in basically every game he plays in. So uh, my prediction that he would struggle with foul trouble or my concern that he might struggle with foul trouble wasn't exactly going out on a limb. But, uh, yeah, he had one foul at halftime, I think, and he ended up fouling out. Anton Watson fouled out as well. Uh, Ben Gregg somehow only ended up with three fouls. He had all those in the first half. Um, And, yeah, that was – I, I, you know, we can argue forever about refs with Zach Eady, and that is part of the reason I, I do not enjoy the Eady experience. Is that literally every single game that Zach Eady plays in, uh, it just becomes an argument uh, from from everybody on both sides about whether he's fouling or people are fouling him. It just becomes like a fucking clusterfuck of of guys in the paint and like that's what it and then like Edie goes to the bench or like they're not really dumping it into Edie and Purdue's playing this beautiful but Purdue by the way I'm 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 all over the place Purdue next year is going to be the most fun team in the country Purdue is going to be so fun Miles Colvin and Cam Heidi and and Fletcher Lawyer and Braden Smith and and they got a cannon catching coming in and I don't know how much he's going to play he's super talented but uh Painter likes to keep his freshman on the bench so who the hell knows how much he's gonna play I think Purdue's gonna be very very fun next year um but yeah part of the reason I I I don't I'm just kind of over the Zach Eady experience is that the the discourse over whether he's fouling or not fouling there was like his first post touch tonight he drew a foul he turns into a guy displaces him and then he goes up and he gets fouled and they call the foul on Gonzaga and Mark Fuse losing his mind but then like another time down Eady travels but there was a little bit of contact. Now Matt Painter's losing his mind, but Mark Few's losing his mind, and now we're all losing our mind. We all want reviews. We're all fucking arguing. It's just like it's it's become it's become too much. It's become too much. Um, so having prefaced it with all that, I'll say this: if you're going to beat Purdue, uh, you you number one, they you can't have them knocking down threes, and you have to play ED. Maybe not one on one. You have to send doubles. But you cannot send predictable doubles. They have to. They have to. You have to not show double. You have to make it seem like it's one on one. They have to be late doubles when he starts going into his move, um, or you just have to live with the, the with with him hitting his baby hooks and just you know that's fine. But at least we're not collapsing our defense in and leaving shooters wide open. If Purdue is hitting threes, you're fucked. You you cannot let Purdue hit threes. Number number two, you have to attack Zach Eady on defense and not be scared of this idea that he is one of the best defenders in college basketball. He is in certain contexts, which is um, he will park his ass underneath the rim, and when big guys are doing, like, picks and pops out on the perimeter and they catch the ball and they're wide open, and EK hit a couple threes tonight, uh, big guys have a tendency against Edie to be wide open and either they, they pull the trigger on a three that they shouldn't shoot, which Graham EK should not have shot their shots, but he made them, so it's like you can't really be that mad at him. Um, or – they get a full head of steam and try to like jump into him and challenge him at the rim. He is good at that. He's good at at stopping one on one post moves. He's good at stopping big dudes that are trying to take him off the balance in those situations. Um, but 
to to beat Purdue, you have to limit their threes, and you have to be willing to go at Zach Eady and do it over and over and over and over again. Uh, and then the other thing is when you're guarding Purdue and you're not you're not doubling down too much and not collapsing your defense and leaving guys open for three, uh, you can't get in foul trouble. And ultimately, that might come down to the refs. That might come down to how aggressive you're guarding him. I don't really know. Um, but Gonzaga, in the end. Uh, they they were checking some of those boxes for a little while, and then foul trouble got them. I think uh, they they got a little gun shy with with going at Edie. I felt uh, they 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 were running their actions, they were getting good looks, but they just kind of uh, the shots stopped falling, and then they got a little gun shy about which shots they were taking. Um, and Purdue was hitting threes, and and if that's the recipe, there's I I honestly I'm. I, I don't I don't know it, it would be a good game between Purdue and UConn I'll put it that way I don't want to say nobody could beat them in the country because UConn does look like an absolute juggernaut but uh, I don't I if Purdue plays like they did tonight they that's going to be a hell of a game if if they do in fact meet in the national championship uh, let's talk about visible again draining a half court buzzer beater win the game not easy switching to visible and saving on wireless with no hidden fees yeah that's pretty easy switch to visible the wireless company with nothing to hide and get one line wireless with unlimited 5G data powered by Verizon just $25 a month every month taxes and fees included one line wireless just $25 a month taxes and fees are included. Visible is the wireless company with nothing to hide, no hidden fees, no gotchas, unlimited 5G data powered by Verizon. Bench wireless with hidden fees and switch to Visible. Switch now at Visible.com. Rate with service on the Visible plan. For additional terms and network management practices, see Visible.com. Uh, yeah, I think Purdue's going to the Final Four. I think Purdue I mean, that, that Purdue-Tennessee game is going to be very fun. They played earlier in the year obviously. Purdue, Purdue beat Tennessee in a good game. Uh, and, and yeah, I gotta fill in my bracket here. But yeah, I mean Purdue, Purdue and UConn appear to be on a collision course now. Tennessee, I, 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 I'm, I think Tennessee theoretically could match up well with Purdue. I think they can play physical defense. I think they, they uh, have guys that can, that can. Uh, you know, they they are defensive minded team. They could they could crawl up into Purdue's guards. They can they could uh, antagonize Edie a little bit, but they do play physical defense. And the first time they played, they got in foul trouble guarding Edie. I I assume the same is going to happen again. They're going to need a monster game from Don Connect, and they're going to need a little luck uh, with Purdue not hitting shots. But uh, that is that is going to be an absolute banger of a of an Elite Eight game. But otherwise, I mean, whoever comes out of Duke, NC State, I think Purdue has to feel pretty good about their matchup there. Um. Let's talk about the the Houston Duke game. I am so sad for Jamal Shedd. Uh, this game was playing out exactly as everybody anticipated, which is Houston was Houston jumps out to an eight zero lead. They are they are our motherfucking Duke a little bit. Like Duke looked like they got punched in the mouth. Now Duke settled in, and and before Jamal Shedd got hurt, Duke did kind of go on a run and and make it a closer game, but. Uh, we were we were buckling in for a very disgusting game of basketball, and that's what it ultimately ended up being: fifty four fifty one final. Uh, not not really that great of shooting from either team. Um, I don't know. It wasn't it wasn't quite as disgusting. Now I'm looking at the box score. It, it felt way more disgusting watching it. But uh, very low scoring, very slow pace. Um, but yeah, it, it felt like a game that Houston was playing on their terms. They were feeling great about it. Jamal Shedd turns his ankle and. Uh, you know, we could we could do the what if and and say if Jamal Shedd plays, then Duke probably doesn't win, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. I think if Jamal Shedd stays healthy in this game, Houston wins this game, and uh, I would point to the fact that yes, Houston, it was a, it was an ugly, sloppy game a little bit at the start, but I actually felt like it was like a controlled ugliness, and it was Houston playing the exact brand of basketball that Houston wants to play, which is not like bricking shots and 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 mucking it up it's just like being uh very very sound defensively um and having Jamal Shedd at the point of attack like swallowing up ball handlers and setting the tone on defense uh is a huge luxury and he goes out and I I Houston has great team defense they have they have great defenders up and down the roster but when you lose Jamal Shedd you lose you lose that point of attack defender that just sets the tone and I felt like their defense was definitely hurting. I mean, Jamal Shedd's the best defender in college basketball. So of course, losing him, you're going to you're going to struggle defensively. But uh, offensively, you're now losing the guy. And and Houston's offense wasn't 
tonight it was, but like Houston over the course of the season, their offense was not as bad as it sometimes felt. Now they would get they would get in these games uh, every so often where uh, you know the final scores would be in the fifties or you know like when they play Iowa State, it'd be a defensive slugfest. But I, I felt like Houston's offense actually was better than it got credit for. They have shooters. Uh, Sharp is a good shooter, and Cryer is obviously one of the best shooters in the country. Uh, Jamal Shedd can knock down shots. They have dudes that can shoot, um, and they have they have big guys that can, uh, you know, Francis can't shoot, but uh, Roberts can make some moves. He gets a little crafty underneath the rim. Um, so I the, the offense, it kind of got overblown throughout the season how bad Houston's offense could be. They, I actually felt like they had a pretty good offense, but – what made their offense good was Jamal Shedd getting into the paint and, uh, you know, driving and kicking and um, just being a tone setter on that end as well. I mean, that's why I feel like Jamal Shedd, I don't even know if this is controversial to say, I, I, I think Jamal Shedd, there's an argument that he's the best two-way player uh, in college basketball, given how important he was to Houston's offense and defense. And we're talking about a Houston team that was the number two overall seed in this tournament, was the, the champion of the Big 12. All that sort of thing. Uh, they lose Jamal Shedd. I, I, we all kind of knew it. We all kind of knew that was it. Uh, shout out to Houston for for making a game of it. LJ Cryer did all he could. Jawan Roberts tried uh, to kind of. I don't know if that's the spot that we want him in, but he he tried to make it happen on his own as well. Um, but yeah, I mean this game was this game was kind of lost for Houston when Jamal Shedd turned his ankle, and uh, I'm very sad about that. Now, the good part for Duke or the the the. If we want to give Duke the flowers, um, which, you know, Duke beat a 13 seed, they beat a 12 seed, they beat a team that didn't have their All-American point guard and best player, and then now they get to play an 11 seed, and that's their path to the Final Four. That's fucking crazy. That's crazy. But uh, I will say Filipowski uh, Kind of rose to the occasion. He had a great game. Filipowski played great. Uh, I think this idea that Filipowski was was playing tough was a little overblown. I mean, I think, I think Filipowski was just putting his head down and like driving into dudes, and um, and he really had his success when he was just hitting threes. And and he plays a finesse game of basketball. I mean, Kyle Filipowski wants to be Mike Dunleavy Jr. and he's trapped in a seven foot body. He wants to be a small forward. Kyle Filipowski. Every day wakes up and is like, God damn it, why am I seven feet? Why can't I just be like six nine? I would be so much better. Because um, now he's seven feet and he has to bang under the under the basket on on the low block. And he's like, I don't want to do this shit. I just want to shoot threes and put the ball in the deck. And when he does that, he's good. Uh, but yeah, he he had a monster game, and I felt like this matchup was one that was that was going to eat Filipowski alive. It was going to eat the the Duke guards alive. Uh, Duke does sort of. I, I did feel like Duke has been soft throughout the year, um, and I felt like early on in the game, Houston was setting the tone. We were headed down that path where Duke – I don't think Duke could handle 40 minutes of Jamal Shedd and company uh, just crawling up into their shit, and I guess we'll never know. I guess we'll never know, but Duke did rise to the occasion. Tyrese Proctor had some monster plays down the stretch. Uh, McCain was – semi I felt like he was sped up a little bit a little bit off his game tonight only had seven points um but you know he he still found ways to be productive uh yeah Jeremy Roach made some plays down the stretch he had 14 as well um this Duke team very very talented the bracket is now broken open for them they are probably going to the final four and all I can think as I'm staring at this bracket TJ is goddamn you, John Calipari, for taking the Duke versus Kentucky Elite Eight matchup away from us that we should be having. But also, I would like to point to this Duke team. There, there are not a lot of differences between this Duke team and this Kentucky, this year's Kentucky team. So those of us that that were drinking the Kentucky Kool Aid and thought, listen, I know they've been up and down. I know they haven't looked great at times, but they have looked better at other times. And boy, it's been a roller coaster this year. And can we trust them to string together this many wins? And in March, I don't really know. I don't know. Yeah, fuck it. I'm gonna have Kentucky go to my lead eight or my final four. Some, you know, Brandon Walker picked Kentucky to win the national championship. Uh, and then Kentucky loses in the first round, and you and everyone points and laughs and says, "Why would you believe in Kentucky?" Because what this Duke team is doing is it. K- Kentucky could have done the same thing. Kentucky, it was right there for Kentucky as well. Uh, they're they're similar teams. They're they're loaded with talent. Um, when when you're looking up and down Duke's roster and you're like, yeah, that guy's gonna play in the NBA. That guy's gonna play in the. Oh shit, that guy will probably play in the NBA too. I did the same thing with Kentucky, TJ. This should be Duke versus Kentucky in the, in the Elite Eight. I, I'm happy it's NC State. I'll cheer for NC State. I love the NC State story. But goddamn it, Kentucky, this could have been awesome. This could have been Duke versus the. Uh, uh, 
a Duke and Kentucky, uh, two teams that are loaded with talent, but also had up and down seasons playing in the lead eight. It would have, it would have been awesome. And, and you took that from us, Jack Olkey. I think I'm anti Jack Olkey, by the way, we, which we could talk about later. But, uh, after meeting him and him coming right at my throat within five seconds of meeting him. Yeah. I think I'm mad at him for taking out Kentucky. Yeah. I did. Uh, I did want to bring in a Duke expert to, to talk that game. If you're, if you'd be willing to have him on right now. Uh oh! Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Dan. What do we do right, about I'm Duke? Not, live from live from uh, my basketball headquarters. We're in the Situation Room. Um, I wanted to update you. Listen, Duke fans know basketball better than anyone in the world. Mm-hmm. They're pure basketball fans, and Duke fans. I'm calling on them tonight to vacate this win. There's mm-hmm. no way they would have won this game. If Jamal she, uh, she doesn't get hurt, they need to vacate this win. Shed, Jamal Shed, Jamal Shed, vacate this win tonight before we all go to bed. We need to vacate this win. Duke fans, stand up. I know you have it in you. You should not accept this win. You should go home to Durham. You should let Houston play the next game. This is what's right. This is what America needs. So vacate the win, and then we'll go on with our tournament without Duke. That is what we need to do. I agree with you. Do the honorable thing. They are an honorable university. Um, yeah, I, I I think they have to do that. That's the only thing that makes sense. It it's it's listen. I think Duke fans are reasonable. They understand they shouldn't have won this game. They a lot of them are in my mentions right now, being like, "There's no chance we win this game." And yeah, have I resorted to becoming the like LaFraud Mickey Mouse guy? In replies, yes, I have, but that's okay because I see injustice and I speak up. If you don't speak up, that's how tyranny happens. Great okay? point, great point, Big Cat. Great point. First they came for Kentucky, and I said nothing. Right now, you you have to stand up to this kind of stuff. If this guy doesn't get hurt, he's a he's a national player of the year, and I have a vote. I don't have a vote, but Titus has. I a have vote. a vote. I have a vote. Yeah, should I vote so for you? You're gonna vote. Yeah. You were going to vote for Jamal Sheed to win. I always say his name wrong. Yeah. Which Shed. Is, yeah. <laughs> I say she, I know it's Shed, and then I say Sheed, Sheed. in my head because I'm like, Rashid. Uh, either way, that's all I wanted to say. I wanted to hop on real quick and just say, Duke fans, do what's right. Disavow this win. It shouldn't count. You guys know all about how you can move wins around with Pete Gaudet. It's super easy. You can get Coach K's. Uh, daughter, or whoever's running the university now, and you can just be like, hey, we understand this wasn't fair. We're not going to take this win. We're out of the tournament, and NC State will just go to the Final Four. Where are we at with the uh, Duke panic in general now? They, they have to play an 11 seed to make the Final Four. This uh, So I obviously wanted Houston to win very badly tonight, but I actually feel more alive than I've felt in a long time because I told you before the year or two years ago, I was like, I'm not going to just hate John Shire. I'm going to let the hate come to me. The hate has come all the way back to me. I've yeah. felt it come all the way back. Phil Pals, Phil, Phil Kaus, Phil, that guy yep, who fucking yep. pretended to sprain his ankle, uh, he brought all the hate back. And then John Shire, like, you know, apologizing to the fans and all that stuff. This is the first time I felt alive in a few years. I have Duke fans like they're in my mentions, being like, "Cry about 2015." Yeah, I will cry about 2015. <laughs> I'll cry about 2015 for the rest of my life. You fucking idiots! But I'll also hate your guts and I'll troll you and I'll get under your skin. So, Titus, I actually am rooting for Duke. I want I want DJ Burns to end their season, but I'm okay with them getting to Phoenix. Because I would like to face them, fa- like face to face, see the f- Duke, Duke fans. fans. Yeah, and and yeah. and it's also nice knowing, like I feel like for the first time in my life, I'm like a five five guy at a bar picking a fight, and I have a, a six eight, three hundred pound man behind me, yeah. and I can just tap him on the shoulder, and his name is Yukon Huskies, and I can be like, can you just take care Please. of this for me? Yeah. So I know I can, I can, I can act brave because I'm not worried whatsoever, and I don't think they beat Purdue either. Or Tennessee. They stink. They just play shitty teams and guys who get hurt, and they should vacate their wins. So no panic. 
Just fun. I'm going to enjoy this ride. Uh, if Duke makes the Final Four, I found it. I knew it was in my bag. I was digging it up. Uh, we got to pull out the uh, Coach K fact sheets. <laughs> I still have my – I still have when, my <laughs> – So here's the question. When did ago. Coach K – when did Coach – how many years did it take Coach K to make his first Final Four? Uh, it, it, it's on here somewhere. It's on here somewhere. I don't know uh, if that I don't know if that stats on there, but it had to have been a few years, right? Uh, bullet points: Justice for Pete Gaudet, Coach K beat a dickhead to students. COVID safety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we'll bring it back. Out. Sore loser, but- scolding opposing players. Coach K doesn't care about money. <laughs> Yeah, he belittles people. But here's the thing is we, we got all types of spin zones. What Duke fans don't understand is that I'm a born loser and a, a guy who's got nothing to lose. You never want to get in a fight with a guy who's got nothing to lose. Yeah. I got nothing to lose. What's the worst that can happen? They can win a national title and I'll just have to be more of a loser? I don't care. So if John Shire goes to a Final Four here, I think we can confidently say John Shire is a better coach than Coach K ever was because he went to a Final Four in his second year. And then he'll get absolutely curb stomped by UConn and it will be great. So, yeah, everything's good for me. I feel great. As long as UConn is still in it, we we can all calm down. We just have we have yeah. UConn. Yeah, yeah. All right. There's a big bully. There's a big the bully who will take care of all of our problems. But yeah, yeah, I just wanted to just remind Duke fans that if you consider yourself uh, the cream of the crop in college sports fandom, you will do the right thing and vacate this win. I'm going to go to sleep now, and I fully expect when I wake up, the headline on all the major <laughs> publications will be Duke has vacated the win. And and eliminated themselves from the tournament. And then I, you know what? If that happens, I'll say, guess what, Duke fans, hand up. I was wrong about you guys. You yeah. aren't a bunch of dorks, front running losers who fucking cry about everything <laughs> and are just the worst people in the world. I'll say you're not that bad. Very classy move from Duke. Uh, if they do the right thing, I agree with you. Thank you, Big Cat. Okay. All right. See you guys. You're the best. Thanks, man. <laughs> I do I do wish I do wish there was some sort of recourse for Houston. That sucks to have your su- season ended by injury. Um so yeah, maybe maybe uh maybe Duke will do the right thing, TJ. We we shall see. Uh Roback Active Wear, this is the only thing I will be wearing all of March and the rest of the year for that matter. March Madness may be the best weekend of all the sports. And it isn't the same without Roback first. Roback's performance hoodies are a total game changer, maybe the softest, stretchiest hoodies in the game. They're moisture wicking too, so when you're sweating out that bed or bracket buster, Roback's hoodies will get you through. Second, Roback's performance Q-zips bring a new meaning to the word comfortable. They are the definition of versatile, perfect to rock in an arena or on your couch. These Q-zips are incredible. Finally, Roback's performance joggers, which I'm wearing right now, are made for March. They're flexible, allowing for easy movement and celebrations when that buzzer beater falls if you want a perfect bracket you wear roback so check out roback and use code titus at roback.com for 20 percent off your first purchase that's r-h-o-b-a-c-k.com 20 percent off performance hoodies crew necks joggers and more with code titus roback.com um what else uh we talked about tennessee dalton connect we now have dalton connect versus zach ed uh, the two best players, I believe, over the totality of the season in the country. Now, Illinois fans have been getting pretty rowdy as of late. They're 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 really feeling themselves. They're very excited of what Terrence Jan- Shannon Jr. is bringing to the court. And uh, you know, I don't blame them. That's part of being a fan is sticking up for your guy. Uh, I I think it's been Dalton Connect and Zach Eady from uh from from the start of the season till now. And now we get to see them playing against each other with a chance to go to the Final Four on the line. I'm looking at the bracket now, TJ, and I'm thinking through the doomsday scenarios. Um, because that's what you have to do. Now, I'm a believer in acknowledging the boogeyman. Some people around these parts think don't don't say anything because then you're speaking it into existence. I operate under the opposite line of thinking, which is if you say it and you sit there and you think about it a little bit, that way the reality, one, you're kind of jinxing it, but two, if it does happen, you've already kind of processed what that will feel like so it doesn't hurt as much, right? So I think the doomsday scenario, obviously Duke beats NC State, which seems likely. Uh, Duke goes to the Final Four. I think Purdue going to the – Zach Eady outside of West Lafayette has – has an outside of West Lafayette and, like, the national media guys that cover him, um, he has a very low approval rating. Or is that just the bubble that I live in in, uh, in this Barstool world? I, I just feel like – I feel like everybody – I do feel like he's about as least like 
as as a national player of the year has ever been in my lifetime. Yeah, I think most people watch Zach Eady throw shoulders and throw elbows and play the way he does, and they're like, oh, that kind of stinks. Even yeah. if they don't know basketball schematically. And again, for the 10 trillionth time, Purdue fans, we don't hate Zach Eady as a no. human being. We don't. We don't. None of Like, I don't. Like, the, there's the straw man situation that goes on where they're like, I don't get how people could hate this guy. All he does is. He helps old ladies walk across the street. Right. He fucking, what are some other things good people do? He saves cats out of burning buildings. Wait, you save cats out of trees. You save, like, babies out of burning buildings. Um, I don't know how you could hate this guy. We don't hate that guy. We don't hate him as a human being. We just, we are praying for his downfall. It's that simple. Like, that doesn't, we don't, we don't, we don't want bad things to happen to him. We just want him to... Suffer humiliating defeat at the at the biggest moment of his life. That's it. That's that's a pretty reasonable request, isn't it? Um, Duke versus Purdue in the Final Four, and then on the the opposite side of the bracket, UConn is the juggernaut. Now, here's a question I'm going to pose to you, TJ, because I might I might live too much too much in this world. So I need I need someone that again, don't take this as an insult, but you know you are a college basketball fan you watch a ton of college basketball but maybe you're not quite as yep. in the trenches as i am is yukon a is yukon a bully is yukon a villain is yukon the bad guy of college basketball they are the defending national champions they're the number 1 overall seed they have not looked even a little bit beatable in this tournament so far uh and yet they're playing illinois and i don't know illinois is the underdog but like who are people cheering for in this game? Because the yeah. Terrence Shannon situation right, does right. add a little wrinkle to this Illinois. I think UConn's definitely big bad wolf, like because they won last year and they came in and they look so dominant in tournament games, which is what the majority of like the casual fan are watching. Like they watched the tournament last year, they saw UConn smash everybody into pieces. They watched the tournament this year, they're smashing everybody into pieces. I don't know if they're villainous though. I think Purdue's more villainous because of Zach Eady. Also, like when you're saying doomsday scenario, what? I, I, I guess I'm I saying Doomsday you, as uh, as if, if you're so a far, hater. It sounds awesome. If you're a hater, if you have, so I I, I think Duke Purdue. Th- no, it would be awesome. It'd be great basketball, yeah. great games. I'm just saying, if you're motivated by hate, um, Duke is obviously the most hateable program. Now, John Shire has I, in my estimation, made them less hateable than Coach K made them. But then, of course, we had the court storming situation, which threw them right back into the uh, onto the hateable throne. Um, Zach, so you have you have Duke versus Zach Eady on one side, and I think America would be like, I hope, I hope a meteor right. hits, hits the, That's, uh, hits that, the those stadium the for that game. Uh, and then on the other side, I do think UConn should be the villain, but I do think Illinois, with how brash their fan base is, UConn is too. But UConn backs it. Like UConn, just won a national title. Like UConn has a reason to be brash, and I think those of us, maybe this is just the Big Ten bias shining through. But Illinois fans, and I say this lovingly to Illinois fans, I've I've fought battles with you guys. I've been in the trenches with you guys the year that Michigan got awarded the Big Ten championship, even though you beat their ass on their home court. I fought in the trenches with Illinois fans over that one. Um, so I say this lovingly, but you guys are obnoxious assholes on Twitter, and you know that. Um, so maybe there's a contingent of like the Big Ten fans that are like, I don't want Illinois to win. I don't. Or people that have that have dealt with it, like Illinois has had a, uh, an un an unearned arrogance about them the last few years. Now it's 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 becoming more earned as they win Big Ten tournaments and and now they're in the Elite Eight and all that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, it's a weird dynamic because Connecticut checks every box of like fuck those guys. But I I think an argument could be made that like Illinois is actually the bad guy in this game. Um, and then on the other side, TJ, if Bama beats Clemson, we, we, we still have a path where Rico Bosco's Alabama Crimson Tide could be playing Rico Bosco's Duke Blue Devils in the national championship, and we're all in Phoenix with him. And um, I don't know what we do in that situation. I, I don't know what we do. I, I don't know. I do not know what we do. Uh, body armor. This episode is brought to you by Body Armor Zero Sugar, the brand-new sugar sports drink from our friends at Body Armor. Provides real hydration with no artificial sweeteners, flavors, or dyes. Whether you're looking to stay hydrated or recovering from a long weekend, Body Armor Zero Sugar has got you covered with great-tasting flavors like fruit punch and lemon lime. They're a huge partner of Barstool. We love Body Armor. They even got the PMT guys to bear it all in their new commercial, so go check that out. Body Armor Zero Sugar is available in stores nationwide. Head on over to the Body Armor store on Amazon. And get yours today. I love all three of these flavors. All three of these. Fruit Punch, Lemon Lime, Orange. All of them are very good. Uh, 
I have been a fruit punch guy in the past. I dabbled with the lemon lime. I'm I'm in my orange phase right now. We have it all over this office. It is it is so very good. And uh, of course, I drink the uh, the water as well. Uh, let's look ahead to tomorrow. UConn, Illinois, Alabama, Clemson. Uh, we are now in the standalone portion of the uh, of the tournament. This is exciting. We no longer have to do dual TVs. Um, UConn, Illinois is going to be the better game, I think. Uh, Bama, Clemson already played this year. Clemson won at Alabama. Um, Clemson has has proven to. I mean, we talked about it last night. Like Clemson is is is, is suddenly become the best three point defense in the country uh until nc state tonight was like wait we might be but uh it if bama's hitting threes i i think bama has to i mean that's just kind of how i i have i have been critical of nate oats nate oats's approach in the past um i don't always love that alabama only has one speed and i don't i'm not even talking about tempo i'm talking about just like their approach to the game uh, because they can fall victim to the same thing that like Tommy Lloyd fall, uh, fell victim to that uh, Roy Williams used to have trouble getting winning a national title because he was the same way. And when people used to criticize Roy Williams, uh, it was it was sort of the similar thing that we're, we're on Tommy Lloyd about now, where, whereas Roy Williams, though, was like making Final Fours at least and, and couldn't win national championships. Tommy Lloyd's losing in the Sweet 16. But uh, I do think Alabama has that element of, like, we only know how to play this one way, and if we're not hitting threes, fuck it, we're just going to keep jacking until – we're just going to keep digging ourselves into into this hole deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, but having said all of that, if Alabama is, in fact, hitting threes, uh, they're going to run Clemson off the floor, I think. And that's, that's what – like, Alabama has positioned themselves in this – quasi underdog role they're not going to be underdogs against Clemson but they're going to tell themselves they are they're going to say Clemson beat us in Tuscaloosa um I think they only lost two home games this year Bama I think they lost to Tennessee and Clemson those were the two games they lost at home um they're going to convince themselves they're underdogs they certainly did it uh against North Carolina they they were underdogs against North Carolina and they probably told themselves against Grand Canyon everybody was was hot on that that 12 seed Grand Canyon team so, you know, Bama is in, a, in, in an interesting position where they have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder. Um, they're going to push pace. If Grant Nelson if, – if the Grant Nelson from last night shows up tomorrow, um, I'm not really sure what Clemson can do. And that's no disrespect to Clemson, but uh, I do think that this game will likely be played on Alabama's terms. And if Clemson can, can bring the defense – the defensive effort that they've, they've brought thus far um, – It'll it'll be a game, but if Bama's raining threes, uh, I don't know. It it could uh, it, it's I don't want to say it could get ugly, but uh, I I keep waiting for a Clemson or NC State to come back down to earth, and um, it feels like a prime candidate tomorrow because of just the style of play that that Bama plays. UConn Illinois, the the spread is outrageous, and UConn has er, earned the right for it to be that outrageous. But I do feel like it's a little bit insulting to this Illinois team. Illinois has got dudes. I think, I think Terrence Shannon is going to be the best player on this floor. Um, and it doesn't, that it's not, always, it doesn't always work that way. You can't always just point to like the, the, the number one player on each team and say, who's got the better player. That team's going to be the better team. But the way he is scoring the basketball right now, um, it's, it's, I, 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 I am not in a comfortable position to count out Illinois. Now, I keep looking at this word on my bracket that says Connecticut. I just keep staring at it. And, uh, boy, <laughs> they are playing some, some very fine basketball right now. And uh, no part of me wants to be the dumbass that suggests that Connecticut might be in trouble. But uh, the firepower that Illinois brings, if Illinois can push tempo, UConn likes to play a little bit slower. If they can push tempo a little bit, be willing to, to be a little – I don't know what I want out of their defense because I think part of me wants wants Illinois to throw some shit against the wall. Now Illinois has made some strides defensively. Illinois' defensive effort has has ramped up immensely in the last few weeks, and uh, I love what I'm seeing out of Illinois uh, on the defensive end. But I think this might be a game where uh, they throw a press out there a little bit uh, for stretches, just a, a few possessions here and there. Maybe they throw a zone out there for a few possessions, which. Um, I, th I think they're willing to do from time to time. Um, I think they, they, they speed up UConn a little bit, get UConn playing off-tempo, and then trust that offensively Shannon, Damask, Hawkins, Danger, when he gets rolling, 
um, all these dudes that they have that can score the basketball. I mean, their offense is, is unbelievable. Trust that they're, that's going to carry them. I, I think Illinois – what I'm saying, this is a long-winded way of saying I think Illinois has a path. I think Illinois has a path. I think <sighs> – I don't want to pick Illinois, though. I'm not going to pick Illinois to win, but that's going to be a hell of a basketball game. I, I think Illinois, if Illinois doesn't give UConn a good game, I think UConn's going to beat the absolute shit out of whichever team in the Final Four they meet. Like, I don't I don't like Bama or Clemson as a matchup with UConn. I, I do kind of like Illinois. I think the Big Ten teams might be the only teams left. I think Tennessee, if Tennessee plays UConn in the championship, I don't really like that matchup for Tennessee. I like Purdue or Illinois against UConn. I don't think either team will beat UConn. I think you, it's it's UConn's title to lose. But uh, this is as good of a matchup as we're going to see out of UConn before the national championship game, I think. I think this might be it. If Illinois can't give UConn a good game, we might as well just send the trophy to stores right now and, and save our time. So, Would you call that your visible game of the day for tomorrow? You know what, TJ? <laughs> I think I might call that my visible game of the day. Ever wish you could call a foul on your wireless carrier for their hidden fees? Then it's time to switch to Visible. Switch to Visible, the wireless company with nothing to hide, and get one-line wireless with unlimited 5G data powered by Verizon, just $25 a month every month. Taxes and fees included. One-line wireless, just $25 a month. Taxes and fees are included. Visible is the wireless company with nothing to hide. No hidden fees, no gotchas. Unlimited 5G data powered by Verizon. Don't let hidden fees stop you from being a fan of wireless. Switch to Visible and save. Switch now at Visible.com. Rate with service on the Visible plan for additional terms and network management practices. See Visible.com. Yeah, that uh, my Visible game of the day tomorrow. I'm going to power rank the games tomorrow. Number one, the Visible game of the day. No, you know what? I'm going to go in reverse order. The runner-up for Visible game of the day tomorrow is Alabama versus Clemson. Uh, the, the Visible game of the day tomorrow... <laughs> is UConn versus Illinois. The last thing I'm going to talk about, and then we'll get out of here. Uh, again, thank you to everybody that, that that watches tonight. I know it's Friday night, and, and a lot of you have better things to do. Um, actually, probably not. Probably not. The people, maybe, no, no, we're, we're all college basketball. John. We don't have better things to do. We're watching college basketball. That's, what, that's why we're all here. Uh, but I, I do appreciate you guys staying up late with me and uh, and and talking about all this stuff because I, I i love this so much i love march madness so much and i'm so sad as i look at the bracket that we only have a handful of games left um but one thing i wanted to talk about before we get out of here is this is the conference narratives the acc fans absolutely have earned the right to to be loud to be brash to um puff their chest you have three teams in the elite eight for a conference that uh was not respected all season was was treated like an afterthought all season and now you look up and you have three teams in three of the elite uh, three of the eight teams left in the elite eight are from the ACC. The Big East only has one. The Big Ten has two. Um, the SEC has two, and that's it. And and the the ACC obviously has the most at three. And uh, so yeah, this is this is where we're at. Is like the ACC fans are are kind of spiking the football they're kind of saying it like there's no big 12 teams left the big 12 we worked under the assumption all season that the big 12 was the best league in the country there are no big 12 teams left in this this in this field um an acc fan you have a duke team that just knocks off the big 12 champion and you know if you're an acc fan you're like this is this is crazy that the the big 12 uh gets the benefit of the doubt and the acc doesn't especially at a time where where um the ACC is kind of getting squeezed out on the the national level as as it's a power it's an arms race with all these power conferences. The ACC is kind of lagging behind, and and there might be a little bit of a complex from ACC fans about that. Um, I just I, I I don't want to stop you. You've earned the right to to get excited about it, but uh, I do think Alabama beating North Carolina does throw a wrench in that a little bit. I do think that 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 causes a little bit of a problem. I also think. It's a little disingenuous to 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 use the Duke Houston result as a feather in the cap when Jamal Shedd got hurt, and as as Big Cat pointed out, Duke should do the right thing and vacate that win. Um, but I I do find it funny this time of year when conferences get very excited about you know the the representation they have left in the tournament. Uh, but I I never fully understand TJ where we're supposed to draw the line. Um, and and that that's the one thing that always fascinates me. I I. I'm consistent about this. When the Big Ten is having a good season, I, I roll my eyes at the Big Ten people that do it. I roll my eyes at the ACC people that do it. Whatever conference is doing it, uh, it, it is always a little bit bizarre to me. I do not think the ACC is winning any of these games. I think the individual teams are winning these games. Um, and, yeah, I would point to the fact that the ACC champion was just upset in the Sweet 16 
by a a mustachioid white boy <laughs> that w- was having a dog shit NCAA tournament and then just balled out on him and and uh, ended their season. So, you know, that kind of sucks for the ACC. Also, the the Mountain West, which is a conference that has a reputation as not being able to do anything in the NCAA tournament ever held Virginia to, like, what did they finish with? Like, 26 points, I think, in that game, in the in the playing game? A Mountain West team held Virginia to, to, to basically zero points. Um, so, yeah, I find the conference narratives crazy, but I also understand why ACC fans are doing it and why they, they, they are pushing back on people that uh, were talking shit about the ACC all year. But I just don't know what, what point, like, if we get to the national championship game and there are no ACC teams in the national championship, does, does that count? Do, do you get a... If you're one of the two conferences represented, um, or maybe the Big Ten, it's maybe it's Big Ten versus Big Ten. It won't be, but maybe, you know, or maybe it's a, a SEC versus SEC. I just don't know where the cutoff is for when we point to it and say, "Aha, there's there's the data point to prove that that we were the best conference all year." And I guess maybe there isn't a point, and that is that is the point: is that there's never a point, and you just have to find whatever cutoff you want and argue your point based off of that. Um, but yeah, the, there's three ACC teams left. There will be one in the Final Four, um, at least. But you know, if there, what if there are two SEC teams and one ACC team? Does that mean the SEC was the best league? Does that mean? I don't know. It's all very confusing. But shout out to the ACC for getting getting three to the to the lead eight uh, when everybody thought you would get one at most. So um, that's that. Uh, all right. I think that's enough. I'll be back tomorrow night after the uh, UConn-Illinois game and the uh, Bama-Clemson game to uh, talk about them. Appreciate everybody for uh, for sticking with me throughout the tournament. Again, we're going to do this every night after, after ball is played. Um, tonight, tomorrow night, and Sunday night. We'll see you guys then.